Weiss. Thanks so much for being here. Pleasure. Really appreciate the time um, in our uh, nice little drive around Detroit car yeah. interviews. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about why you're here at uh, uh, KubeCon while I avoid going to Canada. Um, <laughs> Because it's, it's super easy to fall in the trap of getting in the tunnel, and apparently you can't get out again unless you go to customs. I've heard this, and I'm I'm loving the signs that say "tunnel to Canada" because yeah. it sounds more like an instruction, <laughs> right, like right, you right. know, "tunnel exactly. to Ca save yourselves." Yeah, right, you know? right, right. <laughs> we want we want more immigration. Come to Canada. <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. I still I, the thing I tweeted about yesterday is like I still can't get over that Canada is south of us, which is like hmm. wait. Like every, because you know I'm a East Coaster, right? So the water is always on the you know east side of me, um, and having it on the south side and it's going to the wrong country, it's very confusing in <laughs> <to> my brain. <laughs> yeah, somebody did say that. So they refer to the Canadians as our neighbors to the south. Yeah, right, what? right, right. Um, yeah, I think uh, being an American, I think it's a little bit more weirder for me, right? But um, so yeah, so tell me about KubeCon. Uh, what are yeah. you doing here? Yeah, so here all week, uh, so um, I've been doing EBPF day yesterday, CloudMate okay, EBPF gotcha. day. Uh, then today we had a Cilium project meeting this uh -huh. afternoon, got a talk at Service MeshCon, and then, you know, the main show right, all right. week. So. Uh, and so how was the EBPF day? Um, was there, like, were you doing like a workshop or like, uh, was it more like meetings of the team or? No, EBPF Day was a, a co-located event, so we had presentations mm -hmm. from people, mostly end users, I would say, actually, oh, some cool. projects as well, but yeah. uh, uh, and we wrapped up with a really great panel of uh, people. It was run by Frederick, his note, surname begins with L, but I don't want to say because I might <laughs> Yeah, right, right. But, uh, but who, you can who see it written for, down somewhere. <laughs> yes, uh, it might be La De Noir, I think, okay, um, right. but from TechCrunch, and uh -huh. uh, he had this a fantastic panel of oh, people awesome. talking about um, you know using EBPF in production mm -hmm. people like New York Times and Google and um, Bell Canada nice super yeah, speaking of yeah. Canada yeah. Yeah. yeah yes yeah yes. right um, and did you get like the turnout you were hoping for like was it uh, you know all the people and it, all the it wasn't bad yeah, yeah I would say we actually had a bigger turnout in Valencia but I've got a feeling that there's more co-located events yeah, this there's time, more competition. So yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, yeah, there were a lot. Um, yes. Yeah, I was just looking at the list and like, so many choices, so many choices. Um, Absolutely. So the project meeting you're at this morning, what is, uh, what are you, you know, focused on or what are you kicking around for? Yeah, so this was a new thing for, mm -hmm. for Cilium. I don't know if other projects have done it before, but basically CNCF offered us a, a meeting room and, yeah. and some time and said, go for it. So we publicized beforehand a, a document and said, sign up here if you've got like a PR you want to discuss mm -hmm. or a problem or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a talk you want to give and you want some advice, any, anything right, really. Right. And um, to be honest, not that many people signed up and uh -huh. then loads of people turned up. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we had a pretty right. packed room. We had to keep going out and getting more chairs. Right. And right. Uh, yeah, some good discussions are going on. I've, I've snuck out to come right, and do this. Right, so. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, but it, we, we definitely appreciate it. It's, uh, I, it, we thought it'd be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, what was I going to ask? Uh, so yeah, all I can picture is like a deli counter, right? And you're taking the numbers for uh, all the people <laughs> who want to talk about things. Um, it's always hard to, like, I, I think, although sometimes when you get a group of people who are interested in a discussion around things like PRs or problems they're having or whatever, uh, the conversations that just kind of spontaneously occur are almost better than most other scenarios because you have a bunch of people who are really engaged. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so hopefully it'll... You know, yeah, really it, well. there were definitely some some good little you know groups gathering yeah, and, and yeah. talking about because we had a whole range of people who were new to Cilium who mm -hmm. wanted an introduction and then we had people who had very specific problems that they wanted to discuss or, or a, a, a PR in right. particular that they wanted to get some help on. So yeah, it's, it's some good conversations happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's cool. Uh, have you been to Detroit before? No, this is my first time yeah. here. And what do you think? Have you enjoyed Actually, it? Actually, really nice. So, yeah, uh, yeah I have a, a friend who lives out in the suburbs, took me out on a beautiful bike ride on Saturday. So I got to see all the beautiful trees and, right. and some amazing, like, the, the architecture. There's, there's so much variety. Yeah, I was, I was really yeah. surprised by that myself. It's funny, I, um, I'm staying in the... Uh, 
the what do they call the Renaissance Center here, mm -hmm. the Marriott. I'm, I'm told it's called the Ren Center. Yeah, I, I see that all <laughs> over the place. Um, but uh, I uh, I walked in the building. I was like, this looks really familiar. And I remembered I actually did a sales call to General Motors ah. like 15 years ago to OnStar, <laughs> and uh, and it was in that building. And I was like, oh, that's why it looks so familiar. Okay. Um, but yeah, it is so different now uh like kind of the city in general okay. um and i was talking to some of the locals and they were kind of saying the same thing it's just like how how much it it seems to have kind of come back um but there's still a lot of you know a lot of open space which you know like still still waiting for a recovery from the pandemic maybe but. yeah yeah I, it, i've definitely seen a, a a variety of um you know you can you can see there's a lot of disparate levels of income right right so. yeah yeah um, totally um yeah. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, I, I do like, you know, Detroit's kind of not really in it anymore, but, you know, you get the, the fall colors really well um, up in kind of the northern yeah. U.S., you know? Oh, um, I think it's beautiful. I yeah, mean, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but you said you actually took your bike ride out here on Belle Isle, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we drove about an hour outside of Detroit, picked up a bike uh -huh. that I could borrow, and then rode all the way back in, oh, circumnavigated neat. the hotel, right. <laughs> and then came out to Belle Isle and, and rode around around here well at least you got to uh get yeah. uh, a sense of the you know where the venue was and Absolutely, everything else, right? yeah. uh, which is always nice um i'm uh, i have a panel on wednesday and i was like trying to find on the map where exactly the talk is so i think i've got it um you know i had to like color it in on the map <laughs> so i could like remember but uh are you are you giving a talk this time uh yes well i'm part of the cilium project updates tour, okay so um and, and that's a, a pretty straightforward set of updates. Um, and then this afternoon at Service Mesh Con, oh, yeah. I'm hoping to have a demo for that one. So that's always a oh, little nice. bit more jeopardy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah I, uh, have, you, have you taken to having like recordings as a backup? I, I've never quite, I think I've done it once, but I'm always like, eh, I'm just gonna go with it. I always say I'm going to have a recording. Right, right. Uh, I have about six hours to go, so there's still, yeah, there's plenty there's still of time. time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, it's always more exciting to do it live anyway. And you always, what's nice though, is that the crowd's always with you because they're yeah. just as terrified as you are. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that always, Everybody wants to see right, a demo right. and they want it to go well. You right, know, right. So, you know, at least you have a soft crowd normally. Um, so uh, what, what will you be demoing? Uh, so service mesh, essentially, Cilium service mesh. Uh -huh. um, and we have a nice integration with some Grafana metrics. So okay. uh, it's a very simple, you know, we've got a demo app that's sitting behind Kubernetes ingress set up to be um, uh, of Cilium type. So right. Cilium service mesh is providing that ingress functionality and under the covers it programs Envoy and then uh, you get a nice service map inside a Grafana dashboard and get some really good metrics. Nice, nice. So. Yeah, I, I, one of the things I, it's funny on the on the Insider show that you've done, if, you know, you did before, mm -hmm. um, but also in the old Level Up show I used to do, it's like one of the things that uh, is so hard about using these, you know, kind of modern distributed systems, right, is like you really need those visuals to be able to wrap your head around what's actually going mm. on um, because it's so, because the whole idea of it, right, is it's distributed and somewhat disconnected, but that means your brain has to like connect it all in your head and that's really hard. Mm. Um, mm. So yeah, I really appreciate things like Grafana, um, you know, which really, I, at least for me, helped me wrap my head around it again. Mm. Uh, but uh yeah, so that's cool. You were saying that there's a, a bunch of new integration with Grafana. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of new news this week that uh -huh. uh, Cilium and Grafana are uh, working together and mm -hmm. uh, we've got some really nice uh, integrations. So not only can you export Cilium metrics into the Grafana dashboard, but we also have some Grafana um, graphs and service maps and so on visible from inside the Hubble UI. Oh, that's cool. So it sort of yeah. works both ways. Right, you know, if you right. want it in the single pane of glass yep. in Hubble, it's there. If you want it in the single pane of glass in Grafana, it's there. Right, right. So whichever one you're like already committed to. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, I, especially with things like service mesh, um, can you give the kind of audience a brief run? Like, what is a service mesh? Like, why do I want one? Yeah. So. <laughs> at one level you think but surely kubernetes is running applications and they're networked together right like how, they're already talking to each other yeah the service mesh is giving you this kind of application layer layer seven um additional features mm -hmm. so things like um retries um load balancing so you can load balance across multiple instances of a 
of the whatever back-end service it is. Um, MTLS is a common feature that people want to see from uh -huh. service mesh. And observability is a huge thing. Right, and, right. You know, but I think one of the things that we're um, quite keen on with Cilium service mesh is that a lot of this functionality can be provided by the network. And from an application developer's point of view, they, they shouldn't really have to care what's happening at you know, <laughs> right. different layers of the network. It should be my my service wants to talk to another service and I right. need this kind of configuration or this level of retries or I want to roll out this Canary um, deployment. And uh, so we're kind of seeing it as three layers now. There's the data plane itself, actual network connectivity, passing packets around. There's the at the top, the configuration, you know, do you want to configure a, an ingress gateway? Do you want to configure a gateway API? There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work going on in the, uh, it's called the Gamma Initiative, gateway API, sort of new version that will support service mesh abstractions like HTTP routes. Right. Um, so you configure that. And then in the middle, there's what you could call a control plane, but uh -huh. increasingly I don't think that, you know, application developers need to care about. It. Right. But right. this is the thing that's kind of wiring up how proxies are configured. At, yeah, I mean, at that it's level. kind of uh, Kubernetes in general, right, but service mesh kind of in more specific, um, you know, one of the things I really appreciate, you know, being a long time, you know, application developer, um, and, uh, I guess we're not going to go that way because the road is closed. <laughs> and here is a goose. We that should try not to hit to, the goose. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> who's busily crossing the road? Um, but uh, we, uh, one of the things I really like is this kind of idea of we just want. I just want to give you know the system a hint about what I want, right? Mm. Rather than having it, you know, the number of times you have to go through an install guide and say. Okay, so this is where the database is, and this is where the web server is, and here are the ports they're going to talk across, and all this stuff. And I don't like. I just, I just wanted to, you know, I just want to kind of describe it and then let it figure it out. Mm. Um, mm. And uh, so it's one of the things I really appreciate, kind of about the, you know, more this kind of modern idea of like you're just going to describe the system. You know, I really think it gets back to like even like Puppet really was a big part of this, where you had this. I'm going to describe what I want, you know, and then the software actually makes it true right right yeah. um you know which at least for me is is much better and then on top of that keeps it true which i think is a part people don't fully appreciate how hard that is over time yes right? yes um, that kind of state reconciliation thing which yeah. i think is the the thing that makes kubernetes what it is right you know, a level right. above the things that came before it is this constant reconciliation yeah. of here's my desired state here's the actual state right Right, and, and not ha relying on humans to actually make that stay yeah. true, right? Yes. Um, you know, which, uh, like I said, I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, the other thing is I think it also lets us concentrate on, you know, things that are, you know, for lack of a better term, higher value, right? So we can start to think about, hey, can I make this more like an event-driven system? You know, or, you know, in integrating like serverless and all those mm -hmm. things because I can, I can just put my code where I need to and then, you know, I just have to kind of configure it and then it just works, mm -hmm. right? Um, which I think is huge. Uh, with the service mesh, have you been, um, you know, I guess one of the things I'm still trying to wrap my head around is like, um, I feel like multiple Kubernetes clusters is weird. Um, like as okay. in, I, I want it to be just one thing, um, but this is a, I guess kind of an ongoing struggle. It's like there's, there's people on both sides of this fence where like, yeah. it's like, no, I want to have all these different clusters, right? And I, but I, I want to treat them as one or, you know, whatever. Do you have any kind of feeling about this? Am I just crazy that I think that there should just be one? So it's one of the features that a lot of users really like about Cilium and, and mm -hmm. it's almost too easy. So it's, it's, called, it's <laughs> yeah, called cluster yeah. mesh. Right. And you have your services and you can annotate them, just say, well, this service is a global service. Mm -hmm. And you have to go around and say for each cluster, like, you know, here is my service I don't know, I'll call it tree, because right, I'm seeing right. a lot of trees. So here's my tree <laughs> service, uh, you know, and I want that to be a global service. And in another cluster, I've also got the tree service, and I will mark that as a global service. And Cluster Mesh kind of communicates these um, shared services, 
having a nice tour of a car park now. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> w I, I keep running into closed roads. Um, I'm like, wait. So first of all, the navigation should be helping me with this problem. Second, uh, why are all the roads closed? Um, can I get out uh, over there? It doesn't look like it. I'm going this way. We might have to just go back out the way we came. Yeah. <laughs> this is the this is the adventure of doing the interview in the car is that we'll interrupt for for navigation problems. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, and I'll get back to to Clustermesh. Yeah, yeah, so you have these services um, that are essentially the same service. They just happen to exist in more than one cluster, mm -hmm. and you can mark them as you know I want kind of local affinity. So if there is an available yeah, like a, a pod, or there's an yeah, instance yeah. of it running yeah. locally, so I'd prefer to use that. But if there isn't, I will use one in another cluster. Right. And um, it, as I say, it because you're just annotating services, it kind of seems a little bit too straightforward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. But, and I think that's a really great example of how the network can provide a lot of functionality for you that users shouldn't have to worry about. You know, mm -hmm. users shouldn't have to sort of think about like which bits of network are talking to which other bits. Right, you know, making right. it at a service level, which is pretty much an application level, is that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. No, that I, I definitely agree. I mean, I, it all kind of comes back to that. I guess the, um, uh, like, that's a super nice feature because I think that's, at least for me, right, part of my problem about getting my head wrapped around it is, like, I don't, I don't want to think about the fact that there's multiple clusters, right? I just want, I want my service available all the time yeah. as close to the user as possible. And you probably yeah. want those multiple clusters so you can do things like, yeah, as close to the user as possible right. or like availability zones or, right. you know. Right, right. But, yeah. yeah, other than that, you're not deliberately saying this. This but, one has to go there or that yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I suppose you might want to have different services in different clusters for isolation reasons, but then you probably, you know, the, the multi-cluster thing is less of a... You know, that's yeah, a whole they, different they actually don't want to. Yeah, they, you don't really want them communicating in general. Um, yeah. yeah, and maybe the you know the air gap model, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think the most common example I've kind of heard is around security. But you know, at least for me, like I you know I worked on a system which had a um, you know it was one of those ones where it was used around the world, but its biggest load was at 9 a.m. ish, right? at whatever time zone because that's okay. when everybody logged into it. Okay. And so to make it actually perform, we actually had all this complicated stuff, and this was well before Kubernetes existed, um, but all this complicated stuff to spin up a bunch of hardware, you know, essentially at 850 <laughs> in whatever yeah. time zone so that, you know, it would be able to handle the load um, and then, you know, and then spin it back down again. And being able to, you know, essentially you know, you have not only this kind of management of, of where is the service available or the functionality available, but then also like, um, you know, can you build in scheduling such that that's also as sophisticated? You know, can you, mm. you know, um, I really want to see one of the things I've been um, toying around with is, you know, essentially getting into like AI or machine learning for scheduling, okay. um, yeah. you know, which I think would be super interesting because I want to, you know, I want, I want the computer to notice that there's all these logins at 9 a.m. and preemptively spin up a bunch of containers uh, to prepare for that because I think, you know, it seems obvious to me. One, uh, one of the first things I did with containers, we, we had a startup that was uh, called Microscaling and it uh, was this idea of auto-scaling before auto-scaling yeah, oh, was yeah, cool, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, using kind of uh, control theory, I think it was called, you know, uh -huh. this, uh, kind of trying to predict, you know, based on how demand's changing, like how many more right, containers right, right. are we going to have to spin up, like how fast is demand changing and based on that. Well, that, I mean, that's kind of the problem with current auto scaling, right, is that by the time the auto scaling starts, it's too late. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, you have to, you have to guess beforehand yes. when it's going to happen. Um, and, you know, guessing things like what humans are going to do is such an easy problem, right? Um, <laughs> you know, of course, completely joking. Um, yeah. And you might be better off with a rule that just says, you know, at 850, we'll spin up. Right, right. <laughs> Double the number of instances. So uh, coming back to KubeCon a little bit, is there any particular talk or, you know, is there somebody you're really, you know, glad to have seen or going to see um, that, you know, is a, you know, a particular driver for this particular KubeCon for you? I'm, I'm not going to call out anybody specifically but it's just so great to see people in person yeah, you know yeah. I've already run into a few people that I haven't yeah. seen in person for yeah. a couple of years and it's great to have the opportunity to see people face to face again you well, know, there was some of that in Valencia but uh, there's a whole whole other lot more, group, yeah yeah more, yeah 
Um, yeah, well, I ran into Chris Short yesterday, okay. um, who I did a Twitch show for like a year and a half every week with him. Uh, I was on; we were on the same team. Uh, yesterday was the first day I met him in person. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it was super. It was super interesting. Um, we of course had had the discussion about the fact that he was super tall with the last name Short. So I was at least expecting him to be quite <laughs> tall. Um, but uh, you know, because I'm not that tall, I'm like five ten, right? Uh, and so. Uh, so that was interesting. Um, but yeah, also I think I've now, I think I've now met more people here that I've been talking to for the last two years, um, that I had never met in person. than I have met people in person that I have met in person before. Uh, <laughs> I think is, I follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's super complicated, but yeah. It's not, isn't that crazy though? It's so weird. Um, yeah. And not everybody's here yet because yeah, you know, we're right, still in right, pre-show. Right. Um, Main event kicks off tomorrow. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's still easy to kind of go and register for your uh, daily sticker, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been shaping up pretty cool. I wish I was staying the whole week, but I uh, I have to get back to give lecture on Thursday. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, so I can't stay the whole time, uh, which is too bad. But you know. You do what you can. Uh, it's funny because now, you know, I've moved out of industry into academia about whatever a year and a half ago, um, and uh, the schedule's all wrong. Uh, you know, it's like, it's really funny. It's like the academic conferences are kind of lined up with the school year. Uh, okay. and all the industry conferences are like right smack dab in the middle of the semester. Um, and right. so, uh, it's kind of interesting and it, it's kind of what I've been trying to figure out is like, you know, is there, is there a way we could, you know, fix this somehow? Because I would like to see more kind of academic people at KubeCon, yeah. you know, but like I know for me, I had to yeah. like get coverage for a lecture. You know, it, it's kind of a big deal for me to travel right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's some, kind of interesting in the EBPF world. We have, uh, it seems to me anyway, mm -hmm. that there's a lot more overlap between what's happening in academia. Acad yeah. Yeah. And we quite often get submissions from students or graduate right. students and, right. you know, people who are working on, I don't know, PhDs right. and doing things with EBPF. So yeah. there's definitely. Uh, you know, an overlapping interest. Right, right, no, definitely. I mean, you know, it's like one of the things that I never really knew anything about till I uh, joined Boston University is this concept of uh, multi-party computation or secure multi-party computation, okay. which is like, I was like, I've never even ta like talked about this stuff before, but so there's a couple of experts on my, you know, in my department. Um, and what it is, is like, um, it's, I want to, compute something like, you know, the average of a set of numbers, but you don't want to share your information with me and I don't want to share your, my information with you. Okay. And I don't also want to share any information with a third party. Like right. there's no holder of the information. Right. Um, and so, uh, it's basically, so what you can do is you can kind of, the example that was given to me and I don't tell it very well, but, um, is like, say we both got a grade on a test, right? And we want to know how the class well, how we did as a group on average. Mm. So what we can do is you take an, your number and mm. you add an arbitrary number to it and then kind of tell me the total. Mm. And then we kind of go around the group and then you keep adding it up and then you can take the average of that and you'll get the right average once you withdraw all the arbitrary numbers. Um, right, But yes. I never see your grade, right? Yeah. And, and we don't have to have a third party that we trust that holds the grade either. Right. Um, which is, you know, what I think of as the norm, normal way of doing that, right? Um, but yeah, so they did a, a, a it was a, like a front page Boston Globe article using like some of the professors from BU uh, to do um, the, basically it was a bunch of research around uh, the average pay for women in Boston versus men. Okay. Um, and obviously, you know, a lot of companies didn't want to share that information. Uh, and so that was the technique they used. There was another one too that I think is super interesting is um, they, Boston was trying to figure out how to make... Uh, ride sharing safer in that when they pull over um, to like give them spots so mm -hmm. they wouldn't be basically double parked in the middle of the street. Okay. Um, and uh, Uber and Lyft, they wanted their data, but Uber mm -hmm. and Lyft don't want to share their data with anybody about right. where their drop offs right. are. But so they could figure it out by the same technique by using, uh, you know, I don't know exactly the details of how it worked, but yeah. Um, yeah and so I found out that um, the bar that's like five blocks from my house is the single biggest drop off location for Uber and Lyft in the entire city. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I was uh. like, I knew the place was popular, <laughs> but like, holy, you know, um, no wonder there's all these cars all there, you know, and lying down the street. Um, I've, I've not come across how you do those calculations, but I have come across the problem a little bit in yeah. um, so I'm involved with this 
organisation called Open UK, which is uh -huh. trying to um, advocate for more use of open source and open yeah, data. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and one of the, um, I guess, meetings that I went to, there was a um, discussion about, yeah, how you might have essentially sovereign data or industry data that you want to be able to collaborate on without actually exactly. sharing the data. So, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what this does. It's yeah. super neat. The, I mean, there are some challenges about like what kind of results you can get to, mm -hmm. um, but that's where the research is going. Like, you know, they're trying to solve as many of those as they possibly can, mm. you know, at the moment. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so you can do some calculations, but you can't do everything you might want to. But yeah, still, I was like, that is it's like brilliant. It's really interesting. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so if Open UK wants to get involved with, um, so part of the other hat I wear at BU is we do this experiential learning program called Spark, um, where students work on projects for like external parties. So like okay. it ends up being mostly like local government and nonprofits. Um, but like one of the ones we're working on is for this organization called Museums Moving Forward, uh, which is trying to first estimate the equity at museums um, right now just on like staffing but I think ultimately they're interested in like art and stuff as well um, and so they're going to use this MPC technology to do so um, and our Spark students you know so undergraduates and graduate students are uh, building the software uh, so it's kind of cool. Um, Very cool. But speaking of Open UK as well, I just saw a TikTok from a guy running for mayor of Toronto okay. who was advocating uh, much more use of open source. Um, Brilliant. And that's like part of his platform. I was like, that's very cool. Um, but yeah. That is cool. Was he yeah. thinking of it as code, data transparency? Uh, more as um, actually of, of like saving money. Um, okay, of the, yeah. you know, like, why are we, why is every city building the same software? Right. You know, uh, yes. which I am a strong proponent of as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, it's actually, it was funny. I worked on a system years ago uh, for the state of New York. Um, and I don't know if it's still true, but if you build software for the state of New York, uh, it's required by state law that any other place in New York can have the software for free. Okay. Uh, because it basically it's open source within the state. Um, mm. And uh, which I was like, why isn't that true for like any software that gets built custom, you know, for a, a, a you know, a government entity, right? Mm. Um, you know, because taxpayers paid for it, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to like wait for this light or, because there's no, Hard there's no other say. way to Actually, go, there, right? There is yeah, no... I'm going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought at first this was a line of cars waiting, but no, they're just parked there. Um, see, it's always an adventure when we drive. <laughs> yeah. When you've done this a few, a few more sure times, it'll be a little there, yeah. simpler. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think my my experience with driving around Boston makes it uh, so that I have a, a little bit more experience with craziness. <laughs> um, all right. Well. Uh, why don't we wrap the interview and just kind of say, hey, thanks so much for coming. And we really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, yeah. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for tour of Bella. Yeah, yeah, exactly.